to the last of the metamorphic petrology virtual workshops. Um, we are very pleased to have you here today. Thank you for sticking with us for the whole week. Um, the logistics of the day are just like every time before. Turn off the videos, please. Mute except for the breaks. I, we're going to have another group discussion, and I think at that point, after that, we can also break the mute rule and just kind of chat. Um, use the chat window for questions, and uh, the agenda is still in the PDF. Um, we'll have a break in the middle for a couple minutes. So here is today's overall vision. We're going to have this introduction, something about search functionalities so that you can find stuff. Um, Alex and Mike together are going to lead the examples of finished projects. Well, that'll go for as long as it goes. We'll have five minutes of discussion. Afterwards, we're going to go into a brainstorm about Strabo 2. Um, we'll talk more about it when we're there, but basically, um, what the computer scientists call blue skies, which is if you can have what you want, if you can be at an outcrop in terms of the field metamorphic petrology, what would you want? Um, and then that and maybe a group discussion about that that um, Nick and Mike will lead, but then also a little bit about if, you know, Strabo Micro, and maybe how you want to see that kind of going in the future. So we might have a bit of a brief intro on that. We'll just see how the time allows. And um, it's possible that Julie or I will give a little bit of an intro as we have that. And then Stacia and I will just do the wrap up at the end of the day. All right, um, we're gonna hear about the projects. Um, we don't right, right now have the logistics worked out. So, but we can provide $250 per project for people at U.S. institutions, and again, I apologize to our colleagues around the world, but that's what we're stuck with. Um, and we will send out a follow-up email about um, that information. Frank, do you want to add anything else about that? Uh, no, that's fine. Just send me um, your, uh, you know, the information. We'll have to send you a W-9 and... Uh, let me see. Uh, I'd love to take a look at your project. So uh, tell me, you know, what the name of it is so I can hopefully find it. All right. Great. And great. And are there any other questions right now? Okay. In the absence of that, I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about search. Um, so once you have projects up and other people in your community have projects up, you want to basically be able to find them. So you can, there's a variety of different ways we can do this. Right now, the map-based searching is up. That's available. We are developing the rest of the search functionality at this point. It's not completely ready, but I'm going to show you the proto version of that. And there's going to be limited free text searching as well. The good news about all of this is that you can help us figure out what it should be. And I think for metamorphic petrology, I can see that there might you might want specific things, but I don't know what those are. So to the extent that you can help us figure those out, that would be great. Okay, right now, if you go to stravospot.org and you press the search button, you get this which shows you all the points that people have put in. So it's pretty clear that Doug works in Southern California and I work in Idaho because that's where a lot of the spots are. But you can use this functionality and you can zoom in, zoom out with this. If you develop your own project though and you wanna tell other people to go to it, you can either say, well, go look at Baraboo, Wisconsin for the one that Alex and I put up. Or you can press, I'm gonna go back, this the last button that looks like a chain link fence, which is in fact a link. And if you press that, you'll get a URL and you can cut and paste that URL to get anybody to your spot. So it's a pretty straightforward application. And then anybody can use it. 
This is the new search interface. So you'll see stravospot.org new search. You could type this in, but you can't get there from the, you'd have to know to type that in basically. This works like GeoRef, which is to say you set criterias, you do plus and minus search. So for instance, you select any of a variety of different things, including metamorphic facies, to say where in the world do I have something that has this criteria in it. You can look for a rock type. You could say, I can't remember where the sample's from. This would have saved me enormously. You can just type in a sample number and then if you've taken it in Strabo, it knows where it's from even if you don't remember. So for instance, if you wanna just say, when the data was collected was between 2018 and 2020, you can do that and it will list all the projects that do that. And so you can set a new search just like you can in GeoRef. You can also do this plus or minus, which I'll demonstrate in a bit. So these are all the projects that were done between 2018 and 2020. Now, let's say you really care about myelinites. If you just did a keyword, myelinite, so because myelinite's a vocabulary word, it's hard fixed, you can search on that and you can look for all the places that have myelinites in the world that are in the Strabo Spot database. And you can say how many spots have them. If you want to look for another thing, so strat col so how many people have strat columns? This is before we did the workshop, but basically if you look at strat columns, these were all the strat columns that were in in May in all the different languages that they were put in. You can also do this. You can go to strat column and say, I wanna add a plus. And I wanna know all the strat columns that have carbonates in them. And so here are the three places in the world that had both strat sections, full strat sections, plus carbonates in those strat sections in. You can keep adding pluses. So you could do strat columns with carbonates and uh, evaporites, say, or whatever search you wanna do. There will ultimately be a free search. So you can type in anything into this. It turns out it's a complicated, it's more complicated than you might imagine to do that. So for right now, going back to the Baraboo project, the place it's gonna search first is on the main notes page. So if you want searchability now and basically forever, I would suggest that you put things in that main notes page because that's gonna be the free search. There is notes under pretty much every tag, including samples. And um, you can search on samples, but, but the idea of a free text search, because that's gonna take so long to crawl through the database, we might, at least for the short term, limit it to just notes. So that's where you should put the notes in the short term. Um, so that's the search interface. It's gonna have different things coming up. And that is what I have to say about that. So I will now entertain any questions. Uh, Bezos is Frank. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking at it even as we speak. One thing that I think a metamorphic petrologist would want to do is to search on minerals or even more importantly, mineral assemblages. So if you're looking for all the garnet, cordiorite, sylmanite samples that have been described, that you'd like to be able to search on that. Okay. So mineral assemblages. Yeah. Okay. But a mineral assemblage could just be done by adding, like having, like as Basil was showing with that little plus button. If you can search yeah, by an individual a, mineral, yeah. you could just add whatever <clears throat> mineral assemblage you want, and then you'd be searching on that. As long as it's an and search and not an or search. Right. Right. <laughs> right. And I think we probably will add the and function. The and functionality is there right now. What we don't have is the or functionality. Um, but we can, I think. That's probably a problem, but it's probably a doable issue. So as Noah said, just so everybody is clear, maybe I should get back to this. 
is this one. If right, you could because um, because the minerals are hard keyed in there. You could put garnet, hit the plus, put sylmanite, hit the plus, hit cordierite. And because it's controlled vocabulary, all controlled vab vocabulary is searchable. But it's an excellent well, we, But uh, this, is, this is something we came up uh, against in MetPetDB. Um, you don't want to search for all the rocks that have garnet or cordierite or sylmanite. You want to search for all the rocks that have all, all three. Well, you want to do both, but you know, and, and what you really want to do is look for mineral assemblages because that's where the PT information lies. Yeah, no, we'll make a note, but I'm pretty sure that that's um, how that will work. That's how it works right now. Okay, and good. Can add a keyword input option for each project in Strabo spot that is searchable. Um, yes, so I think if Right now, if you just put that in the notes page, that should work. Rajiv, I might just um, follow up with you just to make sure I understand. Okay, I'm gonna um, go ahead and keep putting comments because I'll keep, keep track. Um, I'm gonna stop video and then I'm gonna turn this over um, to Mike and <clears throat> Alex to take us through the projects. Great, can everybody see this screen? We can. Mm. <clears throat> Fantastic. All right. Well, thanks to everybody that uh, contributed a project. We got um, not quite as many as we were anticipating based on our show of hands yesterday, but we did get a good a good representation. Um, a couple in the Cordillera, a couple along the East Coast, and then a few outliers in other parts of the world. And um, I'll say just to, just to interrupt. You can still get a project and still get the stipend. That's not an issue right now, um, but sooner rather than later would be helpful. Yep. Um, and we also got a good variety of different uses, um, kind of exemplifying some of the different uh, aspects of how you can use Strabo from uh, more of a dissemination tool to a full on you know, active research project. So what's gonna happen here, um, the presentations are in order on the left-hand side here. So just if you're presenting, look at where your name is and I'll go ahead and call out. I have all the slides loaded. So when I call out your name and put your slides up, just go ahead and unmute. And then when you want to advance to your second slide, just say so and I'll move the PowerPoint presentation along. Um, there's no particular order for these. Uh, I think everybody did did a really nice job. Um, Mike, anything else you want to add? Just, just as a matter of logistics, we're kind of hoping for just a few minutes on each one. The main goal is is to a very brief introduction of the geologic goal, and then to illustrate uses of Strabo. So you know we're we're kind of hoping for something on the order of three or four minutes maximum for a you know a brief summary so people get the idea. Yep, great. Yeah, so up first, we have uh, Liz Bolin and Ian a Anderson. So if you guys want to unmute and tell us a little bit about what you did. Hi, this is, El this is Elizabeth Bolin. I go by Liz to most people. Uh, this project is a bit of a work in progress. It's probably never going to be finished because there's so much we can learn about the PT and time conditions in the Southern Appalachians. But this is part of an ongoing project that my lab, my current lab PI is in charge of. And what we've decided to do is put this in a place that all our collaborators and students, both past and future and current, can all see and readily just view the current spot locations, as well as the data that are associated with each of those spots. So we, we like this because it's been a way to quickly and easily collect the data. So obviously we go on field trips with various classes, collect usually random samples that we happen to like in the field. This is a geochronology and PT based project. So it's not a rigorous, let's map the heck out of this one square mile of terrain. It's more of a, we really need an age out of this particular unit. Where can we find the best garnet and assemblage to do that? 
You can go to the next slide. So these are just a few examples. Uh, the first, the left image is a unit from North Georgia, I believe, if I remember correctly. And there are three different spots, sample 1A, 2A, and 2C, just shown on this really terrible outcrop. And we weren't able to get a better outcrop image because there's a very busy highway interstate to the left of this image, and we were being chased off by a state trooper. So uh, lesson learned on that outcrop, but this is the only photo we've got, so it had to go in. So that's where it comes into its own Strabo, is that you don't have to revisit the outcrop to remember where the samples came from. And we do have, or rather I do have in the lab, on the lab computer, a better image of each of these spots that we can upload later. And I really like that capability and functionality. I like the annotation ability, uh, the image on the right, but I especially like the ability to put in all sorts of images that have been published, as well as those that might be works in progress. So the images that are attached to one particular spot here on the right, these are all photomicrographs, uh, electromicroprobe maps of garnet showing garnet zoning, EPMA traverses, uh, PT dot phase diagrams, and garnet SMND isochrons all associated with one sample. And this is, it, it's just awesome that we can do this now. We can actually have this visible for so many collaborators to view very quickly if we just say, oh, look at this spot if you wanna know what the metamorphism was like in the Wadawi group in Alabama, for instance. So that's, that's, that's how we are currently using this and hopefully it will grow from here. Very cool, thank you. Thanks. All right. Next up, we have Joe Bicey. Joe, are you out there? Yep, I'm out here. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. So this is a bit of a contact metamorphism example. And let's start with the upper right. I imported a base map image into Strabo. So I had to use the Mapbox Topo application that people said was really complicated. I thought it was mildly complicated. And so all those little blue lines are dikes. And the project is there's a bunch of feeder dikes for the Columbia River flood basalt that intrude through granitoid in the Wallowa Mountains of Eastern Oregon. And we're interested in some of the thermal effects of those dikes on the granitoid. Uh, but for Strabo on the, let's see, you go up right is the big dike map. And then just to the left of that, you see a single dike cutting across a lake. And that's what's in the image below there. So on the uh, aerial view, I have a point called Jackson Lake Dyke. And you can see that within that spot, you have many nested spots within it. So KD1 all the way through KD14. This is an example of the nesting in Strabo. And what I did is I took a picture of the dike and then I plotted all my sampling locations on that picture. So now I can go back and look at this photo and know exactly where each sample came from. So the info for sample KD3 is highlighted. So I took a sample there. You can see I put in it as an oriented sample with an orientation of 332.37 with the right hand rule strike and dip. I tagged it with the geologic unit, which is a Cretaceous intrusive and partial melt. That sample happened to be partially melted by the dike. And you can see that pretty well along the margins of the dike. Some of the partial melting zone is weathering high there. But this is an example of sort of nesting and importing base maps and things like that. Uh, go on to the next slide. So here's another dike example. In this case, instead of having a single spot for the dike in the lower center, I put a little line along the entire dike exposure there. And then a photo of the dike is to the right, obviously. So I have all my sampling locations again. It was on a slope, so it was hard to get a very good photo of the dike, but you can see that darker brown layer is the dike, and then I'm standing on the wall rock for the photo. So once again, there's a bunch of nested points um, on this spot, but also you can see the nested samples, which is in the upper center here. So the dike, I'm at the spot for Maxwell Dike B, and if you go over to samples, you can see all the samples that are within that Maxwell Dyke B spot, right? And so once again, I have oriented samples and I've input on the 
bottom left, the dike orientation data, right? So strike 150, dip 85, et cetera. Um, and that's for the spot as a whole, not for each nested sampling spot. But that's just an example of, you know, how you would do contact metamorphism. Maybe you're in a Precambrian dike swarm or something like that. This would be, this would apply there. That's all I got. Great, thanks. Thanks, Joe. Okay, next up, Hannah Blatchford. All right, thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm Hannah, and I, I just thought I would take um, an opportunity to explore some of the options for organizing uh, both field and petrochronology data, in this case for just a meter scale shear zone from the Western Nice region of Norway. And so the rock types um, that I've been looking at, at least uh, in this field area, are gonna be variably deformed and retrogressed eclogites, eclogites and, and host nices. Uh, and specifically for the petrochronology data, we're looking at titanite and rutile, uh, with the goal being to extract a larger portion of the exhumation history and to connect that directly with these outcrop structures that we've been observing. And so that's sort of the goal, and it, it's you know organizing structure and um, a lot of lab-based results and to sort of get started, what I thought I would do was explore some of the, the map functionality first. And so I took the chance to um, import a base map from Mapbox Studio. Um, and it's pretty simplified. It's one that I've been using for figures. Um, so I already had it, but it was easy enough to, to incorporate with Stravospot. Um, and similarly, it was really, really straightforward to upload geotiffs of some ortho images that we collected last summer using a drone. Um, and those ortho images were generated with uh, Autodesk software. So mm, the way I've been thinking about organizing this um, and to proceed uh, with organizing it has been like, okay, this is one field site out of, out of several structures in our field area uh, across the Western Nice region. And so I started by just sort of enclosing this within one polygon to say all of these data are associated with one shear zone. Uh, and from there, uploading just some of the images that I've um, been making to summarize the field site. So in that upper right hand corner, it's like a stereo net structural summary, a simplified uh, block diagram, as well as a pace and compass geologic map that we made in our first field season. So that's sort of synthesizing information related to the whole field site. And then from there, um, relying pretty heavily on the drone imagery, going in to document sort of at the, you know, centimeter to 10 centimeter scale, exactly where the samples came from. Uh, and so that's what's shown in this lower right hand slot, uh, part of the slide. And we can zoom in uh, on the next slide with, with one of these sample suites. So go ahead. Yeah, so this is one of the spots. And just like other people have been using the nesting uh, functionality, I thought um, it made sense to do the same thing. Um, we have a suite of samples collected from the core, margin, and host nice of this retrogress eclogite pod. And we have titanite and rutile petrochronology data for uh, nearly all of these samples as well as other ones throughout the shear zone. And so I used this image as an image base map um, and then went ahead and, and did several more sort of layers of these image base maps where, you know, zooming in on, on one sample to a thin section scan and then just in this uh, single example, um, one titanite grain that is then linked with some EBSD maps as well as uh, BSE images with um, some uranium lead um, thermochronology results. And so those spots were mapped out in QGIS um, a little while ago, but I, I suppose that the Strabo Micro might be another um, viable way to, to map out these results. So. So in the project so far, it's just these conceptual sketches and summaries, um, a way to organize sample locations and field photos, and at this point, some maps. But moving forward, it just seems like a very useful way to organize a lot of the figures that would go into a manuscript, potentially, or at least while I'm thinking about how all of this fits together, um, it would be Tara Wasserberg diagrams and, and REE plots, and, and more specifically, thermobarometry results. So um, it's been a great organizational tool so far. That's what I've got. Great. Great. Thanks. Thank you. And that reminds me of one thing that we, we didn't cover in this workshop, but there's a great kind of um, data sharing between uh, Rick Almendinger's StereoNet program and your StereoNet that you showed in your previous slide reminded me of that. So that would be an option going forward is to, uh, you know, use those data and um, go back and forth between Strabo and StereoNet. Absolutely. Okay. Next up, uh, Chris Daniel and Julian Cohen. 
either of you out there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, this is Chris Daniel. And right. um, so I do a lot of work with undergrads. And so I was just kind of thinking, uh, Julian's one of my current uh, research students. And so we are actually just getting started on a project out in Arizona. And so, um, you know, I was interested in, uh, you know, being able to collaborate with uh, Julian. So, you know, I set up a new Gmail account and created a new Strabo account. And, and then uh, we each created a data set. I had already sent him um, some, some GPS uh, files with, you know, images and locations and sample descriptions and notes. So he put in some of the spots and I put in some of the spots. And then um, there was an existing geologic map for the area. So used a map warper to georeference that. And then we imported it and overlaid it on the uh, satellite image there. And we started to actually just digitize some of the map units. So, um, and then I think we can go ahead and go to the next slide. So, you know, this is just one of our spots. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of information in there, um, but it's a, you know, it's a, a convenient way for me to transfer my, my photographs and notes um, and make it accessible to Julian since we uh, can't work in person. And um, so actually I'm pretty excited about the opportunities that this, this uh, presents uh, and having you know, the students uh, be able to work collaborative on projects. So, um, so that's about, about it. Great, great, Chris, thanks. Okay, Oliver Wolf. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, so uh, I approach the project as a way to document uh, some, some field sampling I'd already done and worked on for my, my uh, dissertation. So in, in this, I, when I went out originally, I was going across uh, as many road cuts as I could along roughly east-west traverses to do thermal barometry across several rock contacts in western Massachusetts, and as well as to apply um, quartz inclusion Raman barometry to a wide variety of samples. So for this project, you can see that I georeferenced a couple of the geologic maps from the Worthington and Goshen quadrangle maps and uh, started entering in all, my, all the samples I collected in. And uh, could we go to the next slide? Uh, and so, <laughs> On the left, have to, this is an example of one of the uh, out road cuts we we're going along on an, uh, an abandoned road and collected a, a several samples spaced maybe a few meters apart. And so I kind of, this is how I would approach using Strabo Spot if I had a, you know, if I had a redo on this sort of project where I would Go, go the field, collect as many samples as possible, write down some quick information, and then start. And as I pr do lab work, microprobe work, or um, and barometry work, I would start retroactively updating it to create you know, almost like a living notebook of the, of the field work and the project as a whole. So that's, pretty, and that's why I have for this. Great. Thanks, Oliver. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. All right, continuing, Doug Rumble. Doug, are you out there? I think I saw him. Yeah. You may be muted. We can't hear you yet. Yeah, hi. So uh, I'd like to emphasize the role of StraboSpot as a learning tool. So I find myself living in an area uh, with rock types. I'm unfamiliar with volcanic rocks. I'm unfamiliar with sedimentary rocks, having worked in the past on metamorphic rocks. I'm finding that Strabo Spot is, well, the checklists. Uh, 
I'm thinking of myself as a pilot taking off in an airplane and I've got a checklist to see if my instruments are, are working or my, uh, my engines are fired up and ready to go. So here it is, I'm looking at an outcrop of sediments, let's say a red sandstone in the Supai formation. And what do I look for? Strabo spots uh, lists, uh, tell me what to look for. The other thing, I've been reading the 19th century literature, forgive me for a, a, an ancient historical reference, G.K. Gilbert on the Henry Mountains. He was one of the early people in the Powell survey, later uh, a, a famous member of the USGS. What he recounted was his mapping technique. His mapping technique was riding his horse up to a promontory and looking out upon a vast expanse of uh, many square kilometers of area. And because uh, of the way the, well, it's bare naked geology, he could actually identify, he could, uh, uh, he could identify with his sketch mapping, and then he could, he could project that in a sense of mental projection onto a topographic map that he and his assistants had made with a plane table and alidade. Well, I could do the same thing. So the next uh, slide there, um, this is material uh, that was collected uh, and <clears throat> uh, earlier and then uh, earlier this year and then posted into Strabo spot. Um, the, um, th this, is, um, this is a mountainous area uh, northeast of Flagstaff. Uh, these are day site domes primarily. Um, some uh, some uh, younger uh, basaltic flows on top of them, but they the lacolithic intrusion has uplifted and tilted members of the Grand Canyon uh, stratigraphic succession. So I can hike up there and sit on a promontory just like G.K. Gilbert would have done so many years ago. I don't have a horse to ride, but anyway, and then I can make, I can take photos. I'm not a very good sketcher, but I take photos of the uh, surrounding area. Um, and then I start identifying, you know, that white hill over there, that's the Kaibab limestone, et cetera. And all of a sudden I'm building a geologic map. I'm learning the local geology. I'm learning what to look for in the, in the, in the Kaibab limestone because, well, Strabo spot actually tells me what to look for, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I'm finding this and I'm a new, I'm a new, uh, I'm a new recruit. I'm a new uh, disciple, you may say. Um, so I guess I have that certain sense of enthusiasm for it, but it's working very well for me. Anyway, thanks to all. I just emphasize the learning experience, the very valuable learning experience. Now, mind you, I'm a student, yes, but I'm a student with a certain background and a certain vocabulary that I've already learned. Mind you, students, undergraduate students, you'd have to teach them a lot of things, but I do believe that if they have any facility at all with the digital world, and if they're like my grandchildren, they definitely have facility. Uh, this thing's gonna turn out very well. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Doug. Thanks. Next up, uh, Mike Davis. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Mike Davis. I'm a master's candidate at um, San Francisco State working with Mary Leach. And we're working in the uh, central Adirondack Highlands at this location called Ledge Mountain. It's mostly a mesoproterozoic magnetite dome with uh, metamorphism occurring 1,200 to 980 million years ago. And um, we collected, well, I didn't, but um, previous samples were collected, um, 33 of them from 1978 and then again in uh, 2014, 16, and 17. Um, so there's a lot of previous samples and Strabo is able to let me input them all into one place. <clears throat> um, I have an overlay of some field work by Garrity in 1978 just to show how I'm using the overlay feature. Um, yeah, I guess uh, next slide would be good, please. Thank you. Um, so the way I'm using Strabo Spot is uh, mostly an organizational tool now, but I'll be using it as an active sort of field mapping tool once we get to the field, once I get to the field. Um, what I liked about the workflow part was being able to select these tabs up here. As I'm inputting data, it was nice to just click through the tabs and put the things I needed to go in each tab um, and eliminate the tabs I didn't need. 
Um, so for each spot, um, I did it by sample. So I've got, um, I input the longitude latitude notes um, from previous um, mappers. So looking back at spreadsheets with notes in uh, previous lab manuals and things and adding notes there. And then images, um, I have the pseudo sections and scans of the thin sections. So I can actually now like have the spatial reference like, oh, here's a spot. This is the mineralogy there. Here's the pseudo section and easily look at the pressure temperature conditions of um, metamorphism. Um, I'm also using the tags feature. Um, since we have so many samples with different types of data, it's nice to be able to organize the spots by the type of data they contain, like if we have whole rock chemistry or if we've scanned the thin sections or if we have um, pseudo sections generated for each spot. And then um, it makes it really easy to just input the mineralogy right from Strabo. Um, I'll probably also add WDS and EDS work in the images. And so everything will just be um, nice and organized as well as um, field photos once, we, once I get those. Um, so yeah, super useful and I'm looking forward to using it in the field and then just being able to do the same exact thing with the new samples that I collect. Looks great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Alan Benioff. Yes. Hi. I'm. Uh, I'm. On, uh, I'm ready to go here, and I, I want to thank everybody. So, what I'm going to talk about? We've been finding granitoids in the diabase of the Palisade Sill, and we. Uh, our hypothesis is they come from melted uh, Lakatong argillites and things like that. So what I'm going to show here, and so what we have here is an occurrence from Staten Island, an extraordinary example of two chemically divergent magmatic liquids now represented by the diabase of the Palisade Sill and a pyroxene trongeomite derived by the fusion of a margins of a xenolith of sodium-rich Lakatong argillite. If we can go to the next slide, I didn't put a lot on here. Some of the some of my photomicrographs are at the college that I can't get into right now. But uh, here's our quarry over here, and the spot is uh, right there, as you could see. And if we start at the, at the top over there, we have an ancient image uh, before they filled in part of the quarry, but they were able to save our particular spot. If we go to the second uh, image, please. Um, so here we have a, a photo micrograph of the xenolith that didn't melt and the part that did, uh, the part that did is shown there as a pyroxene trongeomite. Now, if we go to the third one, which I should have shown second, we have the three contiguous rocks here. Starting at the left, uh, we have the diabase from the Palisade Sill and in the middle is the pyroxene trongeomite and on the right is the unmelted part of the xenolith. And uh, the actual outcrop is shown right underneath that, that you could see right there, the three contiguous rocks. And the, the one underneath neat that comes from uh, the Palisade Sill at the George Washington Bridge area, where we found some, so we found, as you can see, a light colored rock, which we believe came from the fusion of the Lock Lakatong there. And finally, at the bottom, I should have put this first, is the ge geological map of Staten Island. As you can see, we have many rock types there. And that red, uh, that, uh, that, that red color uh, represents the pa Palisade Sill. Now, we've done a lot, lot, lot on this, which I haven't shown. We did the ge geochemistry. Uh, uh, we did the REEs and everything else, and uh, we'll hope to put that that there in in the future. Anyway, I want to thank you. Anybody wants to talk to me about it can. Um, and and I, as, as as I said, I do have a lot of other information which I'm going to add to this over the coming weeks. Thank you. Great, thanks, Alan. Thank you. Okay. All right, Angelica Rodriguez. Hi, um, I'm working in the Colorado River Extensional Corridor in Southern Nevada, specifically on the Irritiba Pluton. And in December and in March, I did some field work with Wenrong and Andrew Zuza and Drew Levy. And essentially what we did is we what did an east-west transect in the Irritiba Pluton. And it's pretty unique because it 
preserves the brittle ductal transition. So that's what this data is from. And if you could progress to the next slide, that would be great. And so essentially what, I, what I'm interested in is I wanted to uh, see if Strabospot could help me um, zoom in and out of the macro and micro scale. And it, it did a great job. So what I did is I first opened QGIS. It's uh, laid it out in a very, very similar way. So I opened it up for reference. And after I, I had QGIS and Strabo Spot open, I imported the Irritiva quad as a base map. And it's a GeoTIFF that was very easy to import. And that was actually very uh, useful. Then I could reference the QGIS and drop a pin and edit my GPS station to match exactly what I had in QGIS. Uh, one thing that I had an issue with is I had a series of samples that didn't have a station associated with them. So I grouped them all together and then I added orientation data. But when I zoomed back onto the map, um, I couldn't see the orientation data. So that's something I would change for next time is I would not group them. I would just add them as samples. And then I have other issues and changes that I'll discuss in the breakout. Great, okay, thanks. How are we doing for time? We potentially have one more, um, but if we're running low on time, um, the authors said that we didn't need to didn't need to see that. I would say go for it. Go for it? All right, great. It looks interesting, so I look forward to hearing about it. Uh, Christian and Donna, are you out there? Yep, this is Donna. Uh, so we just have one slide, uh, and it shows our field site in the uh, southern French Massif Central in France. And we've been working on the Montanoir Mignotite Dome, which is shown in the, the geologic map um, in the lower left. And so what we've been thinking about is the fact that we've been working here for quite a while and have a lot of samples and structure data and petrologic data and ages. And so, you know, what kind of legacy data is, is important to, to put in here that uh, would be useful for us as well as useful potentially for others. And then we've started a new project that extends this work to other domes in the Massif Central. And so, we're also looking to set this up in a way that will be useful for us to use Strabo Spot in the field once we're allowed to, to go there. So for, for this um, project that we started to set up, uh, we thought about well, what would be most interesting uh, potentially to, to others. And so uh, although the Migmatite Dome itself records a low pressure history, there's cordyrite gneisses and there's a schist carapace that has andalusite, cordyrite, selimanite. Uh, there's relic kyanite and the amphibolites in the dome in a couple of places have, have fresh eclogite. And so we actually had a hard time over the years finding these eclogites because they were mislocated on the map or the map symbol in a publication was, you know, 10 kilometers wide or the, the landscape had changed. So we thought, well, it would be useful to put those spots on the map. And then, although we published the coordinates in recent papers, you know, if we put in some outcrop photos, some, some photos of the landscape, and then start filling in photomicrographs and, and maybe eventually some other uh, detailed mapping that we've done or probe data and uh, other things like that. But I guess we're still trying to figure out what, what would be useful uh, to put in here uh, for these different spots. And then should we start filling in all of our data from the NICE, all the, all the ages, for example. And I think it would be useful if there were a way that you could see, you know, the ages show up on the map or something like that, or the pressures and temperatures. Um, but if you have to dive too deeply into the notes, I, uh, I guess we're still wondering what, what would be useful in terms of legacy data. So that's all. Thanks, Donna and Christian. Yep, all right, that's all we have. So thanks to everybody that participated there. Um, any questions or comments from the audience? It's a really nice summary of oh, many different ways to use Strabo, I think. It's, it's really a nice overview. <clears throat> All right, in the absence of obvious questions, I'm gonna suggest we take our break now. Um, let's come back in eight minutes, so five minutes before the hour. Um, so. 
for me, that's 1.55 p.m. in Central Time. Um, we'll be on in the meantime, so everybody, you know, do what you need to do for a couple of minutes, and then we're going to come back and we'll have another community discussion, among other things. All right, we're all back, but it seems like we're the only people who are back. So if anybody has had a thought. In Strabo 2, can you link a picture directly to a sample, as in say, this is a sample of SNB 20-3 or something like that? No, but there's no reason we can't. So link sample, link photos sample. Yeah, that'd be great. We could inherently make all sample spots. Yeah, whatever. Uh, that was something that I ran into. Basically, uh, you know, it wasn't it wasn't clear to me what the best way to do it was, but it does look like you don't want to have multiple samples at a single spot uh, where those samples are different because the characteristics of the samples. Or the, of the rocks and the mineralogy and so on and so forth are related to the spot. So having multiple sample, the capability of multiple samples at the same spot, I was trying to think when you might do that. And I suppose if you were in a granite that was nice and homogeneous and you collected 10 pieces and you wanted to indicate that you had 10 different chunks of the same rock, that would be one place you could do it. Um, but in most cases, I think you wanna have, you, you know, at least the way it's programmed right now, you want to have a single, if you're going to collect samples, you want a single spot for each sample. Otherwise you lose some of those characteristics. All right, it looks like we're all back in the room at this point. Um, I'm not sure how we can go forward. Maybe, um, Nick and Mike, are you willing to lead this discussion? Because Nick, you've got the most experience with Strabo too by a long shot. And we should maybe first summarize the different groups and what they came up with. And then um, maybe after each group sort of comment on, um, on your thoughts about that, Nick, since you're the lead designer on it, and then um, we'll go that way. You did, Nick. Yeah, sure, we can do that. Great. Mike, do you want to lead this, or do you want me to lead this, or how do you want to do that? Are you willing to do so? Mike's okay. muted. Yeah, you, Mike, you're muted. That's all I. Sorry about that. How much time do you want to spend? On oh, I would say, you know, whatever, four to five minutes per group. Yeah. And this, the groups were the same leaders as yesterday? Correct. Stacy, do you guys want to go first just to change things up from yesterday and maybe highlight the some of the bigger the you know the bigger ideas that came forward in your discussion and then maybe we can ask Nick to make a few comments if about things he's thinking about for Strabo too. Yep, no problem. Um, so I guess I can kind of summarize them into things that we'd want to be able to do. Uh, before kind of using Strava in the field in just being able to upload multiple files at once where I think right now you have to kind of do each one individually and so it'd be nice to be able to select a whole bunch of them and then let it run and you can come back and work with them from there um, and then for downloading maps for offline use instead of having to download each one for a single area being able to kind of click on an area and say which maps you want downloaded all at once, just to streamline that. Um, and then some big things for when you're actually using Strabo Spot in the field, just being able to really sort and organize the data by whatever options you want um, in terms of you know displaying that data both in the maps and then in the spots. Um, where it lists all of the spots being able to organize them by, let's say, orientation measurements or where you have samples or certain PT data or certain assemblages and just having more flexibility. 
Um, and then some of the things that were talked about yesterday um, in terms of kind of setting up favorites in terms of those minerals or rock names so that you don't have to see the big lists of all those minerals and rocks if they're not relevant to your field area at all. Um, being able to take orientations under the metamorphic fabrics tab, but having those orientations saved under the orientation tab as well so that you kind of have them in both places. Um, being able to enter in pressure temperature data, you know, and maybe this is something that you'll add in later, but having fields where you can put in actual numbers and not just be describing it by facies. Uh, what else do we have in here? Um, and then on the other end of kind of once you're done with a file, being able to have kind of an output checklist so you can choose what is exported. Um, and then being able to merge different projects together in a more user-friendly way. So if you do have a group, you don't necessarily have to have a group account, but rather could just merge those projects later. Um, and then also the ability to share the project with individuals without necessarily making it public. So I think that's the main things. You can see kind of the full list of suggestions on the screen now. Yeah, I think uh, you covered all the main points. Um, but one thing that, yeah, we were talking about in the main group and also in the, in the breakout is just having the ability to maybe display different attributes or different values on the map. Um, so you can really start to, you know, spatially locate things like different temperatures, different ages, whatever you want it to do. Yeah. That probably came up in multiple groups too. Yeah. And the, this is some comments about the, yeah uh, so the um the symbology is something that we are working to make much better because i think the fact that you have a map in the field where you're geolocated and where you can see your, your distribution of spots is is really powerful uh it turns out that it gets very complicated very quickly um as you start moving into the world of performing like a gis right like where you can have free form um, symbology. So that we probably won't be able to, with the programmer time that we have, make something that is total free form in terms of symbology, but we are trying to make it much more flexible where you can, you know, where tags can get uh, custom symbology and um, where we have more options, kind of built in options that aren't entirely custom, but, you know, to plot mineral assemblage or, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so that's something that we're actively, actively working towards. Stacia, any are there any other specific things that from your list that Nick should comment on right now? Um, I can't think of anything, Alex. Anything uh, no, not not that I can think of right now. But I'll, I'll chime in if. Uh, I'll look through the list now and chime in at a later point if I see anything. Okay. I would like to, I would like to ask if there are any thoughts about uh, Stacia had mentioned merging projects or sharing projects. The way it's done right now in Strava One is um, a little clunky. Coming up with a you know a, a new email address and setting up a new uh, account, um, which would then keep you from getting it in your old account. Um, it would seem a lot more logical if you could set up. Um, a number of, of, of other users to share a particular project. That way each person could have their own account, but be able to share a project. Is, is that being considered at all? Um, we are, I would put it more like we've considered it on a high level, but we're not there yet. Um, I think that is probably in the future where we are trying to get to. And I'll just make a comment, Frank, you know, we've got into this discussion quite a bit in our breakout too about the whole issue of project management. And when you have a, a group and the, the need to create multiple email addresses in, in say Gmail or something just to create multiple accounts, if you don't want to have a single project name with everybody, you know, and we were thinking when, when you gain a new collaboration, 
Do you give access to all your projects to that new collaborator? So some kind of project management scheme that involves a super user that could either turn on and off projects when you're sharing them. And one thing that would seem like a simple thing that might be a start, Nick, would be even to be able to take two projects and just merge them. So if yeah. I can picture somebody doing starting a Strava project and someone else doing one and realizing that they're really compatible and just saying, can we just take these two projects and merge them into one project for future yeah. collaboration? You know, and that one is not programmatically hard. Yeah, that shouldn't be that hard to, to do. And the issue of sharing also also came up in ours where if you're working with other collaborators, maybe you want that project to only be visible to them um, without giving away your login credentials and stuff instead of making it visible to everyone. Yeah, or your yeah. other projects. You might just want to share one of your projects. And... Yeah, so almost setting it up the way you can with any of these file sharing systems of box or Dropbox where you you literally share that folder you know with a specific person or persons Frank and Basil what other, what else came up in your in your group well Stacia basically covered I think everything that we talked about there there was a very a strong voice given for making the input of mineral assemblages um, yeah easier and faster and more streamlined. Um, also fabrics. And I think a very good point was made by um, uh, somebody, Ben, no, some, I can't remember. Anyway, um, to be able to tailor the, uh, the interface as depending upon what you're doing. Um, one of the things that becomes, um, be, becomes cumbersome is, is if you see a lot of things that you're never gonna put any information in on. So, being able to, to sort of tailor what you actually see and make that right up front, rather than having to click through a large number of, of tabs would be, um, would be a, a real advantage. I mean, I think, you know, when I think about these things, I think about, okay, how many, <laughs> how many, how many buttons do you have to push to get to where you want to go? And if you, you want to make that number as small as possible without losing any of the true flexibility, but if you're doing the same thing over and over again, of course, you, you don't want to push 10 buttons when, you know, really, you should only have to push one. Um, I know that people de design computer interfaces worry a lot about this kind of thing. You know, how many, how many clicks does it take to get someplace? And, uh, and that's the same thing here. And I think we can do that if the user, if there's a way the user can select. It, it's sort of like turning tabs on and off in Strava 1. Um, but even within each of those tabs, there's a lot of information that you don't necessarily want to put in. So it might be good to be able to customize a lot of that. So um, I, I thought of it from a more of a practical Strabo implementation. So we want a shortcut icon that's a dodecahedron. So it's clearly a garnet. And if you press that shortcut, you get the last five mineral assemblages you put in. So that you just say, I, it, this is the quartzite assemblage or whatever. Um, and, or, or you could choose, um, and then you can edit it after that. But it seems like that is one shortcut we want. Then I think, and I'm just going to add a little bit here, we want a microphone shortcut, which is turn on voice recognition and populate the notes and save an audio. So that I could just talk into this and I don't have to waste time now but I can see what I've written. And then when I go back from the field, I can type it out in more detail if, I, if the notes aren't good enough. So those are two. And then this one I'm gonna include, we want the sample thing to look like a bag of gold rather than a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> because we thought that that was more clearly a sample because it could be a dirt sample anyway, right? So. Anyway, that was one. And then we want another one, a metamorphic um, shortcut. And included in that shortcut is PT space, where you can actually put your sample in a, the approximate PT space you think it is. Maybe you turn on and off the aluminosilicate triple junction, you turn on and off particular reactions, all that's on the side, but you can say I'm more or less here in PT space as just, a a, a guess and I think and then that would also allow you access to all the metamorphic tab stuff like the fabrics in a clear in a clear way 
So I just think those were shortcuts that worked the way I heard the community working. I, I also thought that we should not have a single metamorphic igneous tab, but we should have an igneous tab and a separate metamorphic tab because you know, if you're, you're usually not doing both, at least. Uh, you know. That's a good suggestion. That's a we, good. Th that we could break the tabs apart. We could have an igneous tab and a metamorphic tab, even in Strabo 1. Yes. Now, I have to say, I'm the structural geologists are the least happy about that one because usually I'm dealing with both at the same time, but that's fine. This is for your community, so it's totally fine. Nick, do you have any reaction to Basil's wish list, which sound pretty good to me, too? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the things we want to get out of this meeting is kind of what are the, you, you've experienced going through the form, right? So what are the shortcuts that, that you would like that allow you to um, jump past that form and do, you know, 60% of data input quickly. And then if you want to dive into the form to put more detail, you know, you can. So those, the shortcuts seem pretty reasonable. One of the things we got into in our group uh, a little bit is that there, there's, you know, sort of two workflows that we're really thinking about. The first workflow is what you're going to do in the field, which is going to handle all data now going forward. But the other one has to do with legacy data. And there was a lot of concern about finding more efficient ways to upload legacy data, either map data and locations or Excel files. Just there was a lot of interest in in down in the future developing better ways to upload into Strabo um, legacy data. There's an awful lot of it and that has to be a goal too. And I think there were, at this point, point was made before, but we, we emphasized the idea of uh, increasingly being able to plot things based on tags or certain tags or at least fields that are already hardwired within Strabo so you could just plot certain data points in the field as you begin to establish patterns and things that you want to then see. Yeah. Temperature Another big thing that we talked about is uh, that one of the big workflows that a metamorphic petrologist would be interested in is to, you know, you get to a station and immediately you take an image and then that's the image base map. Um, that a lot of people seem to be excited about that workflow so that you could, you know, all of the sampling that you do is pinpointed exactly where in the outcrop it is. Which I think that's, that was really interesting to hear because from a structural geologist perspective, that's not usually the way that I would go about things. Although I have done that on really complicated structural outcrops. Um, so having a, a faster way to kind of create an, ima a, an image based ma map that's already wrapped in its spot and ready for you to, um, to map on. Yeah, almost as the first thing you do when you, you know, like a shortcut to snap a photo and that becomes a linked spot base map, right? In a new uh, right. image base map at that spot. Yep. So I have a, a quick question uh, in regards to that comment. Uh, so I don't remember if this was a feature of Strabo too, but is it a possibility that you could like, you know, on the sidebar, there's a camera option. And so the first thing you do is take a picture and then that creates a new spot automatically. Or say the first thing you do is take a strike and dip. And then from that measurement, it says, okay, there's no spot yet, you know, related to this measurement, then let's create a new spot. Yes, that is exactly what the shortcut fun functionality is in Strava 2. So there's that row of buttons on the right hand side. And those buttons create a background spot. So it's a picture, you can take a picture, you can take notes, you can take measurements or a sample, and before creating a spot, and it creates a point spot at your current present location in the background. Okay, got it. Yep. Great. Thank you. Christian, I think you wanted to say something. I'm not sure. Okay. Christian, you're still here? Is he? 
Maybe you had to go. Yeah. Um, uh, I had one quick question, and I think this is more of a question for Noah. I got a little lost on how Strabo Micro will be integrated with Strabo 2. And so once you have kind of different data uploaded and images in Strabo Micro, will all of those images be automatically transferred into Strabo 2 so that when you go back out in the field, you'll have those images with you? So just to be clear, Noah, um, Julie's also on the call. So so you can pass off any part of that question you want. <laughs> well, it, that's the goal. Um, I'm not sure that we've we've worked out yet um, exactly how it's going to work. But yeah, the, the goal is that when you're working in Strabo Micro, you can just go into Strabo um, Mobile and look at the field notes. And you can see the rock that, it, that the thin section was cut from, and you can see the outcrop that the sample was taken from and you can see where the sample is. So our goal is a smooth transition. And we also really want to be able to be in the field and bring up and say, I wonder if someone's worked here before. Oh, look, oh, here are the thin sections they have. Um, I think there are you know, issues with uploading and the field and speed with images and things like that. But, um, but that is where we're going for sure. So right now, what Noah didn't show in the demo is that when you sign in, you can add samples that you collected in the field by, you, you basically say, okay, it's in this project. And then it just gives you a list of all your samples and you select the sample that it is. So it's, it is, as it is working right now, it's linked to samples in the field. Or if you're doing experimental um, work, then obviously there's no field location and it's, um, it can be linked to a, a particular lab. So another way to say this is that when you're working in, in Strabo Micro, the samples you're working on are nested in your field spot. So yeah, you'll, you'll know exactly where they're from and the georeferencing information will be retained. And Julie, yeah. when, you go, when you go back out in the field at some time in the future you, and you click and you go back to an old spot, you're, you're able to right away get back to your micro data too that's been uploaded onto that spot? You that's should the plan. Yeah, you should yeah. be able to get to it. Yeah, because it would be really nice where so much of the time you really update the mineralogy for a spot or a sample once you have that thin section data. Um, and that information will be important for going back into mobile strata so that you can do all the sorting and kind of look at it spatially on the map. Yeah, we'll have we need to work out how to integrate the data that's being uploaded, you know, the, the details and the mineralogy. How is that going to interact with the mineralogy tab that's in Strava? So those are details that we, we're working on. And I will say that we are going to need help from this community about the Strabo micro. So just like the field app led with the structural geology, the micro is leading with the microstructures, but there's whole parts that we're just leaving behind saying, we would do a really poor job of this compared to um, the metamorphic petrology community. And so um, Will Lamb will be leading that effort starting very soon about um, starting to integrate a vocabulary. So you're starting back at zero um, or how do we integrate the vocabulary with what the structural geologists have already done? And we've done a lot of your work um, because we've already thought about how to deal with different instruments and different orientations and how to get the field orientation into the lab. But then there's whole vocabularies that you will need to work out as a community for what you want to save. And I hope we'll use MedPetDB and be able to um, get a lot of the hard work that Frank and a lot of other metamorphic petrologists have put into that. Um, into that system. Yeah, I just said that um, when we started with structural geology, we sort of had to produce the base vocabulary, but we have that starting point. We have the um, we have a really strong vocabulary starting point with MetPet DB, and um, hopefully we'll be able to to look at that and then move forward and focus on the workflow. No, it's it's a tricky thing to come up with a good. Uh, data schematic for, for, for any discipline. Um, 
And I, I think what you've done in Strava Spot One anyway is, is quite good. I mean, you have all the basic elements there and uh, it's good that you didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, but I, but time will tell because MetPetDB wasn't designed as a field uh, thing. It was designed you know, basically as an archive for, uh, for as much information as we could, we could put together in a, a systematic way. Um, so you, you've taken this to the next step, but it's, it's, it's good that they're it's pretty much compatible in terms of the kinds of, of data schema that, that you guys have and that DB has. The one thing I'll add is if dealing with, now that you sort of know what's involved and dealing with Strabo Micro where metamorphism is really something you wanna be actively involved in, I would suggest you write Will Lamb uh, you can CC Julie my, or myself, um, and also to, um, and just say I'm willing to help you guys out with this. And again, we'll we'll see what we can do with who we can get, but um, there will be a major effort needed. Um, and the more people we have, the better off that vocabulary will be. We've seen that over and over. Chris is asking about the function to create AFM, ACF, AFK plots in the field or in Strabo Micro. Uh, if that's something you guys want, we can do it. Again, is this something everybody will want? How to do that? What exactly you want are sort of details that need to be worked out. But if that's important, um, let us know. There is currently no plan to do that. And on a similar note, uh, at one point we we, we work towards trying to, uh, we, MetPetDB allows you to put in analyses with spots and so on, very similar to, to Strava Micro, although I have to say, the, it never got, uh, it was never ready for public dissemination. Um, but we, we did go over this whole thing, and I think what you're doing with Strava Micro is exactly the right thing. But the idea was that you should be able to pick a spot on a garden, which would be linked to a chemical analysis and a spot on a biotite, and get a, uh, a temperature. Um, and it's certainly possible. I mean, I have software to do that. Mike Williams has software to do that and so on. Um, but do, doing it, well, it, it's a question of which language you're gonna do. All my programs are written in Fortran. It turned out to be a, a, a major task. Nobody wanted to sit down and rewrite all the, all the codes, but that might be what, if, what is involved in order to do this. Thermobarometry is not difficult mathematically. Um, and so you really just want to be able to, to do that. And I think that would be a tremendous capability for the Strava Micro, once you get your analyses in, to be able to run different thermobarometers on various different analytical spots. So again, I think that what Alan Glasner did with Strava Tool, Tools is a good example of how to pursue that, which is once we have the data and it, it's in the same data space, then people can write tools and we could have multiple um, different ways of going about doing that and just see which one works and you know which one gets favored over time and whatever. But once you can share data digitally, then you can start making tools that are generally applicable. What language is all this written in, Basil or Nick or somebody? Um, well, the app is written in JavaScript using a React Native. Uh, yeah, React Native is the framework. But the you know the the public API you could write you could access it using any number of of normal programming languages. Okay. You'd so have to I'll, write a little okay. interface or write a bridge to to interact with it, but it's it's essentially um, JSON. Is the, yeah, is the okay. data format. I actually know what that means <laughs> at some point. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do it, but I, do it. I know what it means. So I think at this point, I'm going to um, sort of move us into the conclusion phase. Stacia, um, you're welcome to join me for this. Uh, if you have anything to say about this, I wanted to say thank you for all our participants for sticking with us till the last day. This has been extremely helpful for us. I hope it's been helpful for getting you started. Um, we will work on a lot of the things you suggested. We were looking for this feedback and a lot of it's just gonna be immediately implemented. I hope that um, after we launch the Strabo 2 for structural geology, uh, one for micros for metamorphic petrology can get tested 
and then launched relatively soon after that as well. Hmm. Aisha, do you want to add anything? Um, one thing I would just say is if you are planning to use Strava One at all, which please do, it's still a great app right now. Um, I'm sure you'll run into some problems. And so I guess, Basil, who should people contact if they're noticing any little issues here or there? Um, that's a good question. Um, no, I'm trying to remember Noah versus Alex. We were going to put one of you on sort of the liaison with the metamorphic community. I think it's Noah, but I don't want to misspeak. Yeah, that's fine. So Noah would be the person to contact about that, those sorts of things. Um, the Google Docs will also stay up for a while, for at least another week or so. We'll be keep monitoring that. So if you do something sooner rather than later, that would be very nice to have it up there. Anything else you want to add, Stacia? No, just uh, thank you for attending and thanks for the feedback. I'm also going to do one last thing, which is put that link in again. I didn't mean to do it earlier, but I did. And so now I'm putting it up again. If you have just five minutes, it's 10 questions just about this. Most of them are multiple choice. Um, just finish if you could just do it. So we have some feedback about when we do this in the future, how to do that. And other than that, thank you everybody for attending. And um, we'll stick around for if there's any specific questions.